In this video, I want to introduce the Lorentz gauge. First, let's have a look at some of the things I derived in the previous videos in the electromagnetism playlist. So in green over here, I have written the magnetic and electric fields in terms of the vector and scalar potentials. So phi is the scalar potential and A is the vector potential. And we have expressions that allow us to convert from phi and A into the electric field and the magnetic field. Another thing I've written in green over here is the D'Alembert operator, or as it's also called, the D'Alembertian. So the D'Alembertian, or the D'Alembert operator, is represented by a box. So this box is sometimes written with a superscript 2, like a square symbol, and sometimes the 2 is omitted. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to include the 2 uh, to keep it consistent with the second order derivatives on the right hand side over here. So this is just a shorthand notation. The de Lambertian operator is a generalization of the Laplacian operator. So the Laplacian operator just looks at spatial derivatives. So it's a second order operator and it just includes x, y, and z. Or if, if you're looking at different coordinate systems, you're going to have another three coordinates. So that would be the case in cylindrical or spherical coordinates. This additional term over here takes care of the time derivatives. So this is a second order partial time derivative. And there's also a factor of 1 over c squared. So this comes up in special relativity. And it's very important in the relativistic understanding of electrodynamics. So we're just generalizing the concept of the Laplacian to four-dimensional space-time. The Laplacian just deals with three-dimensional space, and the De Lambertian deals with four-dimensional space-time. Another important thing is that you can actually swap the order of these guys as long as you're consistent with the convention of the minus sign. So this is called the signature of the metric in special relativity. You can choose the temporal component to have a minus sign and the spatial components to have a plus sign. But you can also choose the opposite. You can put a minus sign over here and a plus sign over here. As long as you're consistent and the signs are opposite, so the temporal and spatial components have opposite signs, you're good. So that is uh, all that we need to discuss for this guy. So this is just a shorthand notation, so we don't have to write all of this business over here. So you can actually see that appearing down here. Now let's have a look at the blue and the red equations. These two equations contain all of the information that is contained in the four Maxwell's equations. So Maxwell's equations, there's four of them. Two of them are homogeneous and two of them are inhomogeneous. So two of Maxwell's equations do not have any source terms and two of them do have source terms. And in the previous videos, we actually used uh, the two homogeneous equations to derive these two expressions over here. And then we used the inhomogeneous equations those are the equations with the source terms to derive these two expressions over here. So the source terms are on the right-hand side. So I've conveniently put everything that does not involve the source terms on the left-hand side, and everything on the right-hand side involves the source terms. So that is uh, consistent across these videos in the electromagnetism playlist. So let's examine what's going on over here and over here. We have a second-order differential equation. So both of these guys are second-order differential equations. We have second order differential operators acting on phi and a. So that is different from Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations have, uh, have first order uh, differential operators. So those are first order partial differential equations. Whereas these guys are second order partial differential equations. So we've reduced the number of equations. We've gone from four equations to two equations, but we've increased the order of those equations. We've gone from first order equations to second order equations. So this could be more complicated. And these guys look pretty complicated to solve. But what we're going to do is we're going to uh, choose this a and phi in such a way that simplifies these equations. So we're actually free to do that because of gauge invariance. So in a previous video in the electromagnetism playlist, I introduced the concept of a gauge transformation and the concept of gauge invariance. You can transform uh, to different versions of phi and a. And we called those guys phi prime and a prime. And the way that we transformed is by introducing a scalar uh, field lambda. And lambda was introduced in various combinations to modify phi and a and give us a new version of phi and a. So if we start off with a given phi and a, we can just modify that phi and a to meet our specified condition. And we're allowed to do that because the electric and magnetic fields are not changed. 
both of those combinations are going to give the same electric and magnetic field. And the electric and magnetic fields are the physical things that we're actually measuring. So these are the quantities that you measure in an experiment. And in classical electromagnetism, these guys are a theoretical tool that is used to more effectively calculate the electric and magnetic fields. It gets a little more complicated when you start going into quantum mechanics. So let's have a look at what we can do with these two equations. Immediately, just looking at this red equation over here, we have a very complicated combination uh, inside the brackets. And that's being acted on by this gradient operator. So it would be very nice if we could just get rid of this, and then we would just have a simplified version of this red equation. So what can we do to get rid of this? Well, we can set this equal to 0. We can choose phi and a such that this combination is equal to 0. I'm going to write that over here. That is actually called the Lorentz gauge. So what we want is the divergence of a. So this is the divergence of a. We want that to be, uh, when we add it to this term over here, plus 1 on c squared times the first derivative with respect to time of phi, we want that to be equal to 0. This is the Lorentz gauge condition. And this is exactly the same as if I just move this guy to the other side. So the divergence of a has to be equal to minus 1 over c squared times d phi dt. So this is a partial time derivative over here. So this is a very important condition. Because if we make sure that this condition is satisfied, we can get rid of this. Let's see what happens to this blue equation over here. So if we uh, impose this condition, if we choose a and phi, so they have to satisfy this condition, then what is going to happen to this blue equation? Well, the divergence of a is just going to be equal to minus this combination over here. So let's substitute that in. We'll do that underneath. So what we have is the Laplacian of phi plus the partial derivative with respect to time of what's going to go in the brackets. We're going to have this thing that is equal to the divergence of a. So we have minus 1 on c squared, and then we have d phi dt. So we have two derivatives acting on this phi. Right? Outside the bracket, we have a partial derivative with respect to time. And then inside the bracket, we also have a partial derivative with respect to time. But we have an additional 1 on c squared factor. And we have a minus sign. So this is actually equal to the Laplacian of phi minus 1 on c squared. So that's this 1 on c squared over here. And then we can act with the derivative operator twice, and that's going to give us a second derivative with respect to time of phi. And have a look at this combination. This combination is just equal to this over here. This is the D'Alembertian or the D'Alembert operator. So we can write that as equal to this square box. We have the box, which is the D'Alembert operator, and that's acting on phi. And this is equal to what do we have up here? minus rho over epsilon naught. And this is actually the wave equation. But it's not a simple wave equation. It's an inhomogeneous wave equation. The reason it's inhomogeneous is because this source term is still here. So given rho, we can find phi by solving the inhomogeneous wave equation. So that is this blue equation taken care of. What's going to happen to this equation over here? Well, this has to be equal to 0 by the Lorentz gauge condition. So this entire term is just going to disappear. And so what we're going to be left with is, let's write it underneath, we're going to have the D'Alembertian acting on A. And that's just going to be equal to minus mu naught j. So have a look at this. What we've done is we've actually got the identical equation, or the equation of identical form, for both phi and a. We have a D'Alembertian operator acting on this guy, and that's equal to minus the source term. So all we have to do is we have to specify rho and j, and then we have to solve the inhomogeneous wave equation for phi and for a. And then once we have phi and a, we can substitute phi and a back in over here, 
and that's going to give us the electric and magnetic field. So the Lorentz gauge is a very important and a very practical gauge that is consistent with relativistic theory. So you can see how compact and small this form is. We've gone from these big messy equations over here, right? I mean, this is a huge equation and this is a huge equation. And these are second order partial differential equations, which would be very difficult to solve. And we've condensed it down into these little compact wave equations, these inhomogeneous wave equations. And that is the beauty of the Lorentz gauge. In the next video, we're going to have a look at an alternative gauge choice, and that is the Coulomb gauge. So it's going to be a little more simple than this Lorentz gauge. But you can see that both of these guys have the exact same form. And that form is the inhomogeneous wave equation. Make sure you watch the next video in the electromagnetism playlist, and you will find the Coulomb gauge.